Well, in this lecture, we're going to look at aliasing and the sampling theorem using a simpler approach than is usually done. And we're not going to rely on extensive use of Fourier transform properties and identities, but rather on a simple mapping between continuous and discrete time frequency. So there's three key facts that are going to play out in this discussion. The first one is that an arbitrary signal can be expressed as a sum of sinusoids. And that's basically the Fourier transform. So if we look at how sampling and aliasing affects sinusoids, we can piece together how this is going to affect arbitrary signals because it's just going to be a superposition. The second fact is that when we sample a continuous time sinusoid and in intervals of t seconds, we get a relationship between continuous time frequency uppercase omega and discrete time frequency lowercase omega. Discrete time frequency lowercase omega is units of radians. It's going to be equal to continuous time frequency uppercase omega times the sampling interval cap t. So if I take a complex sinusoid e to the j omega t, I sample it at intervals of n times capital T seconds, then I get e to the j omega t times n. And I can view this as corresponding to a discrete time sinusoid e to the j lowercase omega times n. And right away you see again that lowercase omega is equal to uppercase omega times t. Now the third fact is the fact that discrete time sinusoids are only unique over a 2 pi interval of frequency. You can easily show that if I take a sinusoid e to the j omega n, and I shift the frequency by any integer multiple of 2 pi, that I get exactly the original sinusoid back. And so we have e to the j omega n times e to the j 2 pi l times n, and e to the j any integer multiple of 2 pi is exactly equal to 1. So this is e to the j omega n. And this means that we can't distinguish between a sinusoid with frequency omega and a sinusoid with frequency omega plus 2 pi or omega plus 8 pi. Any integer multiple of 2 pi is going to give us exactly the same sinusoid. So first of all, let's use the second fact that we have this relationship between discrete time frequency lowercase omega and continuous time frequency uppercase omega. We can plot discrete time frequency as a function of continuous time frequency and we just get a straight line and the slope of this line is capital T. Now the fact that discrete time sinusoids are only distinct on a 2 pi interval of omega means that we can restrict the range that we wish to consider for the discrete time sinusoid. So it's conventional in signal processing to use the range minus pi to pi, and I've indicated that on the graph here by the dashed blue line. So it would be, say, this interval here is the interval of minus pi to pi, and that's an interval over which the discrete time sinusoids are unique. Now they'd also be unique over this interval from pi to 3 pi or from minus pi to minus 3 pi. So when I do that, the frequencies on omega that were associated with the interval between pi over t and 3 pi over t, which correspond to lowercase omega, discrete time frequency in this interval between pi and 3 pi, those wrap back around to the interval I'm going to limit myself to, right? Because I can shift any frequency in this interval, I can subtract 2 pi, and I end up with a frequency in the interval minus pi to pi. So my function now takes the form that's shown down here in the bottom. So for example, if I have 0.5 pi over t, say I have a sinusoid here, and I map that up to the corresponding discrete time sinusoid, I see it's going to be pi over 2. However, if I also have continuous time sinusoid with frequency 2.5 pi over t, that's right here, I see that I end up in the exact same location, again with omega equals pi over 2. So this tells us the relationship between continuous time frequency uppercase omega and discrete time frequency lowercase omega. So there's two important aspects of this representation or relationship between these two frequencies. First of all, continuous time sinusoids, if the magnitude of their frequency is outside of this interval, because of this wrapping that we had where 
the part between pi and 3 pi wraps down to become minus pi to pi, continuous time sinusoids outside of this interval end up appearing at the incorrect discrete time frequencies omega. We saw that we had uh, 2.5 pi over t and that that sinusoid showed up at pi over 5 radians for discrete time frequency. It's called aliasing because the sinusoid shows up at a different frequency than you would expect. Now the second observation from this relationship between continuous and discrete time frequency is that if I want to go the other way, in other words, start with a discrete time sinusoid and figure out which continuous time sinusoid corresponds to that, I have some ambiguity. Because if I tell you that my discrete time sinusoid has frequency pi over 2, you don't know whether the continuous time sinusoid is pi over 2t or 2.5 pi over 2t, or it could be minus 1.5 pi over t. So given the frequency of the discrete time sinusoid, one cannot uniquely determine the continuous time sinusoid frequency unless we know something about the range of possible continuous time sinusoidal frequencies. And it's pretty typical to assume that we're going to be only considering this region between minus pi over t and pi over t. And if we limit our continuous time sinusoids to that interval, then there's a one-to-one -one relationship between discrete time frequency and continuous time frequency. And we can invert this function. In other words, if I have a discrete time sinusoid, I know what that should correspond to in terms of a continuous time sinusoid. We can state this condition about recovering the continuous time frequency from the discrete time frequency in something known as the sampling theorem. That applies more generally to a signal x of t, which has a Fourier transform x of omega. So we're talking about a range of possible sinusoidal frequencies in x here. And if that signal is band limited, in other words, the Fourier transform is zero for frequencies greater than some number w radians per second, then in order to have a unique relationship between the signal x of t and its samples x of nt, we must have that w be less than pi over t. In other words, all the frequency content of the signal must lie in this interval given the frequencies in discrete time, because we've sampled the signal, from that frequency content, we want to convert it to a continuous time signal. And that only happens uniquely if we're in this interval. So the sampling theorem basically tells us how big t needs to be for a particular bandwidth of a signal. t must be less than pi divided by the bandwidth of the signal in order for us to be able to uniquely take the samples of the signal and figure out what the original continuous time signal was. Now there are a couple definitions that we're going to introduce here. 2 pi over t is known as the sampling frequency and that's in units of radians per second. It would be 1 over t in units of hertz. Then w, the bandwidth of the signal, is also sometimes called the Nyquist frequency, whereas 2w is called the Nyquist rate because that's the minimum sampling rate. We need to sample at least twice the highest frequency present in the signal to be able to reconstruct the continuous time signal from the samples to have that unique relationship. Now it's useful to look at what is the Fourier transform of the sampled signal. Now usually the Fourier transform is applied to continuous time signals and we're talking about applying it to a sampled signal. And the way that works is as sketched out here, we have some signal, x of t is a Fourier transform x of omega. If we sample that at intervals of n times t, then we get samples x of nt, which we'll call x of n. And x of n is a discrete time signal, so that should have a discrete time Fourier transform x of e to the j omega. Well, the way we're going to define the Fourier transform of x of n is based on the discrete time Fourier transform. We're going to take x of e to the j omega, and we're going to use our relationship between discrete time frequency and continuous time frequency so that we can define a Fourier transform of our sampled signal, we'll call that x of s of omega, as the discrete time Fourier transform with discrete time frequency omega 
replaced by continuous time frequency uppercase omega times the sampling interval. So all we're doing is scaling the frequency variable and we're going to call that our Fourier transform. We know of course that the discrete time Fourier transform is 2 pi periodic. If you shift omega by 2 pi you get exactly the same values of the function and therefore our Fourier transform xs of omega is going to be 2 pi over t which we'll use the notation omega sub s for 2 pi over t. That'll be the period of xs of omega. Now I've re-sketched our relationship between continuous time frequency and discrete time frequency here, but I've added another set of labels on the discrete time frequency axis, and that's through this mapping that we're using to get the Fourier transform. So we have some signal x of omega that we're sampling, and in general, it has some Fourier transform that I've drawn here. And we're going to try to figure out how does this go through sampling and end up giving us the Fourier transform of the sampled signal. Well, the frequency content that is in this region here near zero on the horizontal axis maps through this function to something on the vertical axis. And this happens for all of these different sections of this signal that we're sampling. You can sketch this out. If I look at this section over here, it gets mapped up through this branch of the relationship between continuous and discrete time frequency. So it generates a term that looks like this. So here frequency axis is vertical now. So this section here labeled minus two gives me this component as showing up in the low frequency regime okay, because minus 2 omega sub s aliases to 0. And then this second branch here labeled minus 1 maps the frequency content of my signal that was between uh, minus omega s over 2 and minus 3 omega s over 2 into this interval between minus pi and pi. So I've got this term here corresponding to this going through this branch, the minus 1 branch. And then the one at 0 goes through this branch at 0 and comes out here and so on. At 1 we have what's centered on omega s maps back to being centered on 0. What's centered on 2 omega sub s also get centered on zero and these things all add up. Okay, so all of these frequencies alias frequency content in all these different regions alias down into the low frequency regime and the net result is we get the sum of all of these. This section here is actually a shifted version of the original signal. I can shift this to zero by moving this whole signal to the right by two omega sub s. I can shift this version to be centered on zero by moving this entire thing to the right by omega sub s. This one is already at zero. Then this one I need to move the, the signal to the left by omega sub s. And to get this one centered on zero, I move it to the left by two omega sub s. So it's the superposition of all these terms that have alias down into this band between minus pi and pi for lowercase omega that we're going to add up. The expression becomes the Fourier transform of the sample signal is equal to 1 over t, where that's the sampling interval, and that's a constant that's needed to preserve the energy appropriately. The sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of the shifted versions of my original signal that I'm sampling. And they're shifted by integer multiples of omega sub s, the sampling interval, which is just 2 pi over t. So let's do an example now where we look at the sampling theorem and this expression that we derived for the Fourier transform of the sampled signal. We're going to assume that the signal we're going to be sampling has Fourier transform as shown in this sketch, and this particular signal is band limited to 10 pi radians per second. Because the Fourier transform is zero for values of omega less than minus 10 pi and for values of omega greater than 10 pi. Bandwidth of this signal is W equals 10 pi radians per second, 
and hence the sampling theorem says that we need pi over t to be greater than the bandwidth and that tells us that the sampling interval to avoid aliasing and uniquely reconstruct this signal needs to be less than 0.01 seconds. So in the first example, we'll assume that this condition is satisfied by choosing a sampling interval to be 0.05. This gives us a sampling frequency, 2 pi over t, of 40 pi. So here's what xs of omega looks like in this case. I've got 20 for the amplitude because here it was 1, and 1 over 0.05 is 20. So I've scaled things by 20. My k equals 0 term in this summation has no shift whatsoever, so this is just the original spectrum of the signal going from minus 10 pi to 10 pi. Then when I have k equals 1, I'm shifting this Fourier transform to the right by 40 pi, so it's located here as labeled. Then when I have k equals 2, I'm shifting it to the right by 2 times 40 pi or 80 pi, and so on this process then on the other side, when we have k negative, it's shifting this Fourier transform to the left by 40 pi and by minus 80 pi and so on. All of these individual replicates of the original signal are well spaced apart and distinguishable. We can sketch the discrete time Fourier transform as shown down here. And this relationship says that 2 pi over t always maps to 2 pi. So what was at 40 pi, which is 2 pi over t, now maps to 2 pi. And we have basically the 2 pi periodicity of the discrete time Fourier transform that we expected. And so in the second example, we're going to choose a sampling interval that violates the conditions of the sampling theorem. Because choosing t equals 1 eighth is greater than 0.1 second, which was required by the sampling theorem. So we're going to expect to have a problem with uniqueness of reconstruction here. Well, in this case, 2 pi over t, the sampling frequency, is 16 pi. So when we apply our expression for the Fourier transform of the sample signal, we're going to take, as I've shown here with the dashed lines now, because these are overlapping, we're going to take our original signal spectrum. That gets located centered on the origin, and that's my k equals 0 term. And then the amplitude is scaled, of course, by 1 over the sampling interval, so that's 8. Then we're going to shift this by 16 pi for k equals 1 and replicate that Fourier transform. And then we're going to add that to what we had for k equals 0. And similarly, we're going to shift for k equals 2, for k equals minus 1, for k equals minus 2, and so on for k going from minus infinity to infinity. Now, I've shown the individual shifted replicates, and what this expression says is that we're going to add those up. But when we add those up in this region where they are overlapping, we get I've shown it in the dark blue here, is that where they overlap, the downward sloping line and the upward sloping line sum to give us actually a constant. So we can no longer identify the Fourier transform of the original signal here. And we've got a sum of two things, and there's no way to pull that apart without knowing what the original Fourier transform was. In other words, we've lost uniqueness. Okay, so I've got a case where the sampling theorem was violated and we can't uniquely identify the Fourier transform of the original signal. Again, we can scale the Fourier transform axis capital omega into the discrete time Fourier transform axis lowercase omega because of the way we defined xs of omega to simply be the discrete time Fourier transform evaluated when omega was equal to uppercase omega times t and we get the discrete time Fourier transform shown down below. And again, omega sub s, which in this case was 16 pi, is 2 pi over t, and that always maps to 2 pi.